Today, the witches, virus, central bank, volatility dance. A market update for the 18th of December 2021. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, Wall Street finished lower on Friday, weighed down by big tech as investors continue to worry about the Omicron variant and also digested the Federal Reserve's decision to end its pandemic era stimulus somewhat faster. Stocks moves were magnified by intense activity in the options market, potentially making Friday one of the busiest trading days of the year due to the S&P Dow Jones indices quarterly rebalance, which comes into effect after markets close on Friday. And it's also the quadruple witching day in US markets where options and futures on indices and equities expire. With options expiring, volumes on US exchanges jumped to 16.6 billion shares, far above the 11.9 billion averages over the last 20 trading days. Plus, trading will remain very choppy for the rest of the year as investors grapple falling trading volumes over the coming sessions, Onda's Edward Moyer said. In a speech to Forecasters Club of New York, Federal Reserve Governor Christopher Waller said, Given my expectations for inflation and labour market conditions, I believe an increase in the target range for the federal funds rate will be warranted shortly after our asset purchases end. And Waller also said that the US economy seemed to be on track to grow at an annual rate of 6 to 7% this quarter, and by nearly that much in the first quarter of 2020. 22, and the governor acknowledged that US inflation is alarmingly high, persistent, and has broadened to affect more categories of goods and services compared with earlier this year. And that's why this week he voted to speed up the Fed's taper. The appropriate timing for the first increase in the policy rate, of course, will depend on the evolution of the economic activity, something that I'll be monitoring closely, he said. A key unknown, of course, is the Omicron variant and its impact on the economy. New York State on Friday reported a daily record of new confirmed COVID-19 cases at 21,027. Earlier, London's Imperial College reported that its early analysis of the Omicron variant showed it posed an immediate and substantial threat. We find no evidence for both risk of hospitalisation attendance and symptom status of Omicron having different severity from Delta, though data on hospitalisations are still very limited, they said. Meanwhile, the US Senate failed to pass a bill for President Joe Biden's $2 trillion economic agenda, with action on the tax and spending bill delayed to January 2022. However, it did pass legislation that will ban goods from China's Zhejiang region unless there is proof that they were not made with forced labour. The US also added 34 Chinese targets to its banned entity list that includes drone maker DJI which could hit many YouTube content creators. On the US data front, the number of initial jobless claims for the week was higher than expected, 206,000, and building permits were at 1.712 million in November. The Manufacturing Purchase Management Index was at 57.8, and the Services PMI was 57.5 for December. So all three of the main US stock indices ended with a decline for the week, after the Fed signals on Wednesday. For the week, the S&P 500 fell 1.9%, the Dow lost 1.7%, and the Nasdaq declined 2.9%. The S&P 500 growth index lost 0.7%, and the value index declined 1.4%. In fact, all of the major 11 S&P 500 sector indices fell, with financials leading the way down with a 2.3% drop and energy loss 2.2%. And adding to uncertainty, Pfizer said on Friday that the pandemic could extend through next year. European countries get up further travel and social restrictions, and a study warned that the rapidly spreading Omicron coronavirus virus was five times more likely to reinfect people than its predecessor, Delta. Traders also pointed to year-end tax selling and the simultaneous expiration of stock options, stock index futures and index options contracts, known as the triple witching, as potential causes for volatility. It's a big options expiry day, said Joe Suzuzzi, 
co-manager of trading at Themis Trading in Chatham, New Jersey. And now you draw on top of that some Omicron and you've got volatility. And I think it creates a lot of uncertainty among investors. In Friday's session, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 1.48% to end at 35,365, while the S&P 500 lost 1.03% to 4,620, and the Nasdaq dropped 0.07% to 15,169. Although on the positive note, small cap Russell's Index 2000 rallied 1% after having fallen more than 10% from record high in early November. On Friday's session, Oracle tumbled 6.4% after the Wall Street Journal reported the enterprise software maker is in talks to buy electronic medical records company Cerna in a deal that could be valued at $30 billion. Shares at Cerna surged 12.9%. And FedEx rose almost 5% after the delivery firm restated its original 2022 forecast on Thursday, even as persistent labour woes chipped away profits. FedEx reported fiscal second quarter results that were better than feared and the company raised its full year guidance, Deutsche Bank said, as it lifted its price target on the FedEx to $310 from $299. Financials, mostly banking stocks, fell 2% as the 10-year yield dipped further below 1.4%. Wells Fargo, People's United Financial and Goldman Sachs were among the biggest decliners, with the latter end of the day down 4%. And energy wasn't far behind, down about 1% as investors continue to assess the threat of Omicron on energy demand. Though some investors still remain bullish. Given our outlook on the economy that eventually once we get past the Omicron impact, this economy is still post-recessionally growth, Peter Duffy, Chief Investment Officer at Penn Capital Management, said, we would tend to favour economic cyclicality as the kind of value names as opposed to growth themes, Duffy added. Big tech, meanwhile, continues to bleed, paced by declines in Apple, Google and Microsoft, as their investors reassess the appetite for growth sectors of the market amid expectations for the rates to rise. Although Facebook and Amazon proved an exception to the sell-off. Healthcare was one of the few sectors in the green, as a rally in healthcare information company Cerner offset weaknesses in Johnson and Johnson. Johnson Johnson fell 2.8% after an advisory panel for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention voted to recommend vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna over the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. The CDC flagged new data showing an increased risk of blood clots from the J&J vaccine. The volatility index was up 4.86% to 2157. Gold futures for February delivery was up 0.01% to 1,798, and WTI crude oil fell 2.87% to 70.30 a barrel. The euro US dollar was down 0.78% to 1.1240, and the US dollar index was up 0.66% to 96.64. Now, gold has cleared and closed above its 50, 100, and 200 moving day average at 1,789, 1,795 and 1,786. That could be seen as a slightly bullish technical move. But the rally yesterday was just a small hint of desperate fast money to go to it, I think. Gold bulls have been led to water before, only to find a massive Nile crocodile awaiting them in the watering hole. The jury's still out as to whether the rally is sustainable, although as the US dollar weakness continues, combined with year-end risk hedging, there may still be some opportunity left. Gold has resistance levels at 1,810 and 1,820 an ounce, and that could extend up to 1,840, but we've seen it all before. It may not happen. In London, UK's export-heavy FTSE 100 ended higher on Friday, helped by a weaker pound, but posting a weekly loss as concerns over the Omicron variant and inflationary risks weighed. The FTSE raised earlier losses to close just 0.1% higher, as large dollar earners, including Diago, Unilever, British American Tobacco and Rickett, benefited from the sterling fall. Limiting gains, though, shares in HSBC shed 0.6% after the UK's financial regulator said it had fined the bank £63.95 million, which is $85.16 million, for failing 
its anti-money laundering processes. Retailers gained 0.5% after data showed sales rose faster than expected last month, helped by Black Friday discounts, early Christmas shopping and no lockdown restrictions. I'd also listed shares at Marks & Spencer's and WH Smith, helping the domestically focused mid-cap stocks rise 0.6%. Some of that strength was because households were bringing forward their Christmas shopping amid worries about shortages, shipping delays, and even before Omicron, said Bethany Beckett, UK economist at Capital Economics. Still, retailers are positioned to deal with Omicron better than sectors like hospitality. However, a survey showed consumer confidence was down heading into December as the emergence of Omicron and inflation worries hit spending plans. Oil majors Royal Dutch Shell and BP fell more than 1% each, tracking weaknesses in the crude oil price as surging COVID-19 cases raised fears that new curbs may hit fuel demand. And of course, the Bank of England surprised investors on Thursday, increased interest rate by 15 basis points. That's the first hike since the start of the pandemic as it seeks to tackle a surge in inflation. European stock markets slipped on Friday as markets adjusted to a new reality that central banks are tightening monetary policy even in the face of another COVID-induced shutdown. The DAX in Germany traded 0.67% lower as two of Europe's biggest central banks took steps to combat surging inflation. On Thursday, with the Bank of England raising interest rates for the first time since the pandemic started, and the European Central Bank saying it will end its emergency bond buying programme in three months' time. In contrast to the Federal Reserve, the ECB will continue to buy bonds at least until the end of next year. The Eurozone's inflation rate has risen to a record high in November, according to preliminary data released on Tuesday, prompting further questions about what the European Central Bank will do next with its monetary policy. Headline inflation came in at 4.9% for the month compared to the same month last year. That was above a consensus forecast of 4.5% and was higher than October's 4.1%. That figure was the highest on record in the 25 years that the data has been compiled. High energy prices contributed the most to the latest inflation reading. According to Europe's statistical office, Eurostat, energy is on track for its highest annual price rise in November at, wait for it, 27.4%. From 23.7% in October. Consumer prices rose once again in the Eurozone off the back of higher energy costs and supply chain issues. In Germany, a country historically scared of high inflation, the inflation rate hit a 29-year high in November. They were up by 6% from a year ago, as measured by the harmonised index of consumer prices. The trend is the same in France, where the inflation rate reached 3.4% in November. That's the highest reading since 2008. The question going forward is how the ECB will square the high inflation readings with uncertainty over the pandemic. ECP Vice President Louis de Graus said last week that the central bank still plans to end its emergency bond buying program in March, but market players want to know how the central bank will be adjusting its other tools. The Omicron variant has increased the level of uncertainty even further, but for now we suspect that it will have a fairly small impact on inflation, Jack Allen Reynolds, senior Europe economist at Capital Economics, said. On the other hand, Rupert Thompson, Chief Investment Officer at Wealth Manager Kingswood, said the latest figures made it more likely the ECB will have to reduce monetary stimulus. Eurozone inflation now looks set to remain well above the ECB's 2% target for much of next year, and these numbers will make it all the harder for the central bank to quantify continuing its QE program and hold off any rate rises before 2023, he said. In addition, Charles Hatworth, Investment Director at GAM Investments, said it may be wishful thinking on the part of the ECB President Lagarde when she declares that price pressures won't run out of control. They already are, and it's difficult to follow the argument that it will abate soon. The general trend towards tightening monetary policy appears to be clear, even though the different paths taken by central banks underline deep uncertainties about how the fast-spreading Omicron variant will hit economies. The dust, of course, is settled now on Central Bank Week, with the Bank of Japan leaving policy rates and its 10-year yield target of 0% unchanged. It has announced it will scale back its pandemic bond and commercial buying program in 2022 while extending the SME relief program. The US-Japan exchange rate was sharply unchanged, unsurprisingly, given that US-Japan yield differential is its key driver. The Bank of Japan's announcement follows in a similar vein to the ECB, the lady is not for tapering, tapering, not tapering announcement. Policy rates remained unchanged, but a tapering of the PEPP was announced, although it replaced that 
with what you've guessed it more QE under the old APP scheme as well as continuing with its TLTROs. That's a very European compromise, of course, overall, with the ECB acknowledging inflationary pressures, but well and truly hedging its bets. Overall, the quantity of easing forever family of the Bank of Japan, the ECB, made plenty of noise, but did very little tinkering under the bonnet. Both the yen and the euro are like to have a tough quarter one versus the US dollar. We'll see. Nikkei 225 was 1.55% lower, with markets completely ignoring the Bank of Japan. The South Korean index just was 0.25% down, and mainline China was also lower, with the Shanghai Composite down 0.95%, and the Hang Seng was 1.25% in the red. Australian shares edged higher on Friday, but not enough to recover from a midweek slump, as concerns about the spread of the variant and central bank policy tightening triggered volatility across equity markets. The ASX 200 added 0.1% or 8.3 points to 7,304, but ended the week 0.7% lower. Gold miners posted the largest gains on Friday, thanks to a 1% rise in the precious metals price to 1,795. The gold price has benefited from increasingly hawkish commentary from central banks this week, but as we discussed earlier, it's still pretty marginal. Northern Star Resources jumped 5.6% to 945. Evolution Mining added 4.2% to 394. Newcrest rose 3.7% to 2365. And Regis Resources firmed 3.5% to 191. Gains posted by the major banks also supported the broader market. CBA advanced 2.4% to 99.12, NABRO 0.3% to 2883, Westpac added 0.3% to 2103, and ANZ climbed 0.7% to 2763. More heavy selling across the technology sector held the benchmark index back from a stronger rally. Life 360 dropped 7.3% to 960. Mega Port lost 5.3% to 1818. Tyro Payments fell 5.9% to 269. And Zero tumbled 4.7% to 134.27. By now, pay later stocks fell on concerns that the industry may face tougher regulation in the US. Afterpay dropped 7.6% to 8267. Zipco declined 6.1% to 418. And Seasel dived 9.9% to 291. McGowan Financial Group requested a trading halt until Monday, pending an announcement to be made relating to the termination of a material contract. And Transurban ended 1% lower at 1353 after saying it will pay an extra $2 billion to complete its troubled Westgate Tunnel project, which is already $900 million more than expected. And as the AFR reported, by now pay data stocks were ravaged on Friday, extending what has been a torrid month for the sector, as valuations crumble thanks to rising interest rates and regulators in the US stepping up scrutiny. As the rest of the market rallies into the end of the week, former darlings like Afterpay and Zip were heavily hit along with the broader tech sector. The route was sparked by an announcement from the US Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which said it launched an inquiry into buy now, pay later credit. A number of companies, including Afterpay, Zip, Affirm and Klarna, were asked to provide information to the Bureau and allow it to report to the public about industry practices and risks. The Bureau expressed concerns over practices in the industry, including accumulating debt, regulatory arbitrage and data harvesting. The sector is also facing regulatory pressure in Australia, which plans for more intensive regulation being considered by Treasurer Josh Frydenberg and the Reserve Bank of Australia, which could force buy now pay later customers to pay fees that are currently paid by merchants. Regulatory eyeballs will be on the sector for some time, said George Boris, Head of Research and Executive Director at K2 Asset Management. Quite clearly, there's a lot going on. It's been so innovative and disruptive, it's only natural it's attracting regulatory eyes. The buy now pay later platforms to appease regulators across the board will probably start to offer some form of just buy now product. Despite the hit on Friday, Afterpay declined to shy away from scrutiny. Afterpay welcomes efforts to ensure that there are appropriate regulatory protections for consumers in the diverse buy now, pay later industry and that providers are meeting high standards and delivering positive consumer outcomes while protecting their data, the company said. Afterpay also promotes and enables responsible credit use by pausing accounts from future purchases if a payment is late, capping late fees and not charging interest. US-based buy now, pay later platform Affirm also addressed the CFPB's review and said it was supportive of regular efforts within the industry. Afterpay's fortunes have been largely tied to Block, formerly known as Square, after the US payments chart won support for its takeover. Block shares fell 4.6% to 165.88 US on Thursday, 
caught up in the Wall Street tech rout, which saw the Nasdaq Composite also fall. On Friday, the Supreme Court of New South Wales made orders approving Afterpay's acquisition by Block via a scheme of arrangement. The scheme remains subject to regulatory approval. It's Australia's most successful stock to go from a micro cap to a large cap without a profit. Block is going to be a much bigger entity to take Afterpay to the next level. And once it's complete, it will be a very large global player. Payments veterans warn, though, that buy now, pay later faces more pain in 2022. Once you've got the rates rising, you need to have some earnings coming through. Rising rates lend themselves to other sectors because it rewards earning accretive companies. Even higher growth managers would probably rethink their exposure to the sector. You don't want too much exposure to those companies with no earnings, even as a high growth investor. Both growth to reasonable price managers and value managers will struggle to hold by now. Pay later. And of course, there is still the question of the impact on consumers, because we know quite a few people who use buy now, pay later use it quite responsibly and well, but many don't. And unfortunately, those people already have the debt noose around their neck. And with interest rates rising, that could be a big deal. And so to summarise and to step back, volatility is going to rule certainly for the next few weeks, quite clearly through Christmas into the new year. Not sure we're going to see a real Sanders rally this year. And as with so many things, what central banks say versus what they do is quite different. We've still got the risk from the virus, particularly the Omicron variant, and we still have considerable uncertainty in some sectors of the market. So once again, the message has to be continued caution. So to my mind, at this stage in the cycle, when stocks are truly overvalued, suggest some caution ahead. And that caution may be required for some long time yet, because I think central banks will continue to fiddle for some time, although whether they really do anything at all to make a difference, who knows. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.